Well, hello, and thank you for joining me. Let's begin by praying the act of love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord God, I love you above all things, and I love my neighbor for your sake, because you are the highest, infinite, and perfect good, worthy of all my love. In this love, I intend to live and die. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I've been doing these Wednesday lectures for Lent, and I I thoroughly enjoy them. Today, because we have to change the medium and have the lecture recorded and distributed on the internet, I've changed the topic a little bit. I I hope that that that's something that's agreeable to everyone. I I want to to do a slightly different exercise than what we've been doing, and, and I want to take a moment to kind of explain that. When I was a child, I would get bored on Sundays. Maybe like you did when you were a child. Or maybe like you do even now as an adult. So I I invented a game. A game to play while I was at church. I would listen very carefully to the sermon, and I would imagine that I was the one preaching. And I would ask, how would I deliver the same message? Uh, Of course, I I would explain things that I thought were difficult to understand, and I was a child, so I thought everything was difficult to understand. And I would add my own examples, and I would cut things and rearrange the order. I would add quotes and make the sermon mine, even while I was listening to it. I was blessed to have a pastor who was a very good preacher, and most of my imaginary sermons were very much like his. Now that I'm a pastor, I still play the same game. But, but instead of playing the game with sermons that I was listening to, I, I play this game as I read the sermons of the saints. As I read their sermons, I think, how would I deliver the same message to my people? And this lecture and the ones that follow are, are born out of that question. As I read the saints, I I think, how would I deliver the same message to you, to my people? In these recordings, I'm echoing the saints who have gone before us. I'm not trying to be original. I'm trying to repeat what they said. I'm trying to repeat what they said using my own words, adding my own examples, highlighting connections that are familiar to me, and and really making the message my own. My own perspective and personality will color each of these messages. This isn't a translation. This isn't a paraphrase. This isn't a performance of one of their sermons. This is my own preaching. And yet, if you read the saints, and I'll tell you where you can read them, if you read the saints, you'll see exactly where I got my message, And you'll recognize how I've modified it. I've taken their message and repeated it back with a different tone and tempo, like an echo. This is me echoing the saints. Tonight, I'd like to begin a book by St. Bernard of Clairvaux titled On Loving God. It's a beautiful book considering what it means to love God. We're told over and over again that the greatest commandment is to love God. But haven't you ever wanted to ask why? Why is that the greatest commandment? Why should we love God? What does it even mean to love God? I know what it looks like to love my neighbor, but somehow loving God is different and difficult to explain. Over the coming weeks, we will look at these questions with St. Bernard in his book, On Loving God. His book is a series of 15 short letters that consider questions like these. His letters are very short, never more than a couple pages. He wrote them as food for prayer. You can take his two-page letter with you into pray. Start reading the letter and meditate on the first thing that strikes you. 
After meditating for a few minutes, if you're like me, you'll find that your mind wanders. And when your mind starts to wander, return to the letter and read the next point. That will give you more food to think and pray with. And so you'll slowly make your way through the letter. In this style of writing, because this kind of meditation is exactly what he's writing for, in this style of writing, he just writes a sort of outline of what he wants to say. And he trusts us to fill in the blanks and wrestle with the text, to make it rich with our own experience and insight. I find this type of meditation to be immensely valuable. I hope, after listening to my lecture, you'll print off the first chapter of Unloving God and pray with it. If you do, you will not be disappointed. So let's begin on the first chapter of his book. Why should I love God? Why should I love God? Notice that this question is really asking two different things. First, this question asks, how does it benefit me to love God? And second, the question asks, what is it about God that is lovely? We'll consider each of these questions. Though the first question asks, how does it benefit me to love God? In other words, what do I get out of loving God? There are many answers to this question floating around in our culture. My dad came to faith late in life. But when I was a child, he was an atheist. And he would say that loving God is an emotional crutch to help the weak-minded people cope with the tragedies of life. I often hear people defend their practice of the faith by saying God teaches us a sensible way of life. So loving him is the surest path to being healthy, wealthy, and wise. And of course, there is the view that loving God is a form of fire insurance. We pay our premiums now as insurance against the dangers of hell. I'm not going to take the time to consider what might be true or false about any of these answers. Each of these cultural answers is blind to the greatest benefit that God gives us. It's blind to the fact that God's greatest gift to us is that he gives us himself. Remember that through baptism, you share in God's divine life. Imagine the love that he has for us that through baptism we became God's children. Through confirmation, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you in a profound and transforming way, strengthening you for all the good deeds God wants to work in your life. Through the Eucharist, you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Again and again throughout our lives, God gives himself to us. And so we can answer our first question. What do I gain by loving God? I gain the gift of God himself. What better gift could he give us? Let me press this idea just a little bit further. It's possible to give someone a gift without loving them. If I hand a beggar on the street corner five dollars, do I love them? Probably not. If I give myself to someone, do I love them? Yes, absolutely. God gives himself to us as the perfect expression of his infinite love. Here we come to the first and most important answer to our question. Why should we love God? Because he first loved us. This leads us to our second question. What is lovely about God? What is it about his nature, his character, that makes him lovable? 
What do we see in him that inspires us to love him? Think for a moment about what you know about God's nature and his character. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. He is the lawgiver and the just judge. These are amazing things. They are all awesome things. They are characteristics that are worth meditating on and praying about. But I'm not sure that they always inspire love. There's something deeper. There's a deeper reality, in fact. In fact, God's deepest reality that really does inspire love. God's nature, his very character, God is love. Everything else we know about God is tied to this simple phrase, God is love. It sounds so simple, almost trite. Yet it is a fact that we could spend the rest of our lives unpacking and still never quite reach all the implications. But for now, let us circle back to our question. What is lovely about God? What is it about his nature that makes him lovable? And our answer, God is, by his very nature, love. And being loved by him inspires us to love him in return. We are inspired to return his love when we think about who he is. We are inspired to return his love when we think about how much he loves us. And we are inspired to return his love when we think about who we are. We want to be inspired to love God, so let us think about each of these things. We have already started to talk about who God is. He is infinitely valuable, infinitely good. Psalm 16 expresses this beautifully in a prayer. The psalmist says, Keep me safe, O God. In you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, you are my only good. You are my only good. This is a kind of figure of speech that means something like, every other good is worthless compared to you. There are many goods in our life. There are many different things that are good. But when we compare them to God, they are worthless. He is the most valuable thing in our lives. The psalmist goes on to observe that people who value other things above God will never be happy. Remember, we say that when someone values something above God, they're committing idolatry, that they're worshiping a false god. And so the psalmist says that they multiply their sorrows those who court other gods. Valuing other things above God will lead to greater and greater sorrow. But we worship God alone. We value him above all things so that we can say with the psalmist, Lord, you are my allotted portion and cup. You have made my destiny secure. Pleasant places were measured out for me. Fair to me, indeed, is my inheritance. Look at this psalm. God gives us many good things, but he himself is our allotted portion and cup. He himself is our inheritance. He himself is the greatest gift that he gives us. And this realization leads us and the psalmist to praise God. Though the psalmist goes on to say, I bless the Lord who consoles me. Even at night, my heart exhorts me. I keep the Lord always before me. With him at my right hand, I shall never be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, my body also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to death, nor let your devout one see the pit. You will show me the path of life, 
abounding joy in your presence, the delights at your right hand forever. I would encourage you to sit with Psalm 16 sometime today. Let these words sink into your heart and then speak them back to God as your own prayer, thanking him for giving himself to us. We want to be inspired to love God, so let us also think about how much he loves us. At weddings, we are often We often have the reading from Corinthians 13 about love. It's familiar to you, but it goes like this. If I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if, my, if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If there are prophecies, they will be brought to nothing. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, it will be brought to nothing. For we know partly, and we prophesy partially. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. At present we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. At present I know partially, Then I shall know fully, as I am fully known. So faith, hope, love remain, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When I hear this passage, I immediately start thinking about how I should love. And St. Paul is trying to teach us how we should live our lives. But in this passage, here again, that there's also a deeper reality, a deeper meaning, a deeper teaching. Here in this passage, we learn a truth that's even deeper than our moral lives. Because this passage teaches us about how Jesus loves us. Jesus is patient. He is kind. He does not seek his own interests, but he works effortlessly for our, for our good. He does not brood over injuries, and his love never fails. Too often we think of God's love for us as a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. Not so. God's love for us is intense. It is visceral. God's love for us is revealed in the passion of Christ. Think of the way of the cross. Think of his suffering. Think of how he did all of that out of love for us. That is how much he loves you. There is no greater love than this, that he laid down his life for us, his friends. Think of how much God loves you. One way that we can measure the intensity of love is to think about what the person is willing to give up. Remember that God is more valuable than anything else, more precious, more good. And St. Paul tells us 
that God the Father did not withhold his own Son, but out of love he gave him up for us all. God withheld nothing but poured out his own life for us. The measure of his love is infinite. It's without end. We want to be inspired to love God. So think also about who it is that he loves. It's easy to love a good person, but God does not wait for us to become good people before he loves us. God, St. Paul tells us that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, We were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. God loves sinners. He seeks them out. Remember the good shepherd seeking out the lost sheep. God seeks out those who are lost, who are trapped in sin. He seeks out the evil. And he loves them. He loves even his enemies. He loves them intensely and without measure. God himself is the reason we should love God. He is love, and he has loved us with a love beyond all telling. I want to close today with St. Paul's words from Romans chapter 8. St. Paul has been considering our sinfulness and God's redeeming love, much like we have been considering those two things in today's lecture. And as St. Paul considers all of this, he, he says, What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all. How will he not also give us everything else along with him? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who acquits us. Who will condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, rather was raised, who also is at the right hand of God. It is Christ Jesus who intercedes for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being slain all the day. We are looked upon as sheep to be slaughtered. In all these things we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.